of the various problems relating to extinct forms of man, none is of greater interest than that of which concerns Homo neanderthalensis. This peculiar and extinct species of man lived in Europe for hundreds of thousands of years, but all traces of him vanish when modern humans arrived. Where he came from and where he finally disappeared we do not know, hence every additional fact we can collect about him is of great value. So, let's go on a Neanderthal hunt. In the debate about the demise of the Neanderthal, several scholars have claimed that humanity's nearest relatives were indistinguishable archaeologically, and thus behaviorally and cognitively, from contemporaneous Homo sapiens. They suggest that to hold otherwise is to characterize Neanderthals as inferior to Homo sapiens, a false dichotomy that excludes the possibility that the two human types simply differed in ways visible to natural selection, including their cognition. Support of the Neanderthal indistinguishability claim requires ignoring the cranial differences between the two human types, which have implications for cognition and behavior. Further, support of the claim requires minimizing asymmetries in the quantity and degree of behavioral differences as attested by the archaeological record. Indeed, after more than 100,000 years of evolutionary success in Western Eurasia, Neanderthals rapidly went extinct between 40,000 and 30,000 years ago almost coinciding with the spread of anatomically modern Homo sapiens in Europe. Several scenarios relate their extinction to competition with modern humans, climatic changes during the last glacial period or a combination of both. In this study, scientists proposed a much simpler scenario, in which the cannibalistic behavior of Neanderthals may have played a major role in their eventual extinction. Scientists showed that this trait was selected as a common behavior at moments of environmental or population stress. However, as soon as Neanderthals had to compete with another species that consumed the same resources cannibalism had a negative impact, leading, in the end, to their extinction. To test this hypothesis, they used an agent-based computer simulation. The model is simple, with only traits behaviors and landscape features defined and with no attempt to recreate the exact landscape in which Neanderthals lived, or their cultural characteristics. The basic agent of the system is a group of individuals that form a community. The most important state variable of the model is the location of the group, coupled with a defined home range and two additional factors, cannibalism and the chance of division. The result of the simulation shows that cannibalistic behavior is always selected when resources are scarce and clustered. But when a non-cannibalistic species is introduced into the same environment, the cannibalistic species retreats and the new species grows until it has reached the carrying capacity of the system. The cannibalistic populations that still survive are displaced from the richest areas, and live on the borders with arid zones, a situation which is remarkably similar to what we know about the end of the Neanderthals. Homo heidelbergensis, which lived in Europe and Africa around 800,000 years ago, gave rise to several future human subspecies, including Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, Denisovans, and others. Geneticists assert that until around 588,000 years ago, when these two types of people became separated from one another and started to evolve separately, the lineages of Homo sapiens and Neanderthals shared a common ancestor. In Africa, or someplace nearby, Homo sapiens continued to evolve. Human skeletons have been referred to as gracile, which is anthropologists speak for tall, slender, and constructed for running and heat dissipation. The skeletons of Neanderthals are described as being sturdy, short, and constructed for heat retention. Until they fell extinct around 30,000 years ago, Neanderthals continued to develop and flourish primarily by themselves throughout Western Europe and Asia. Their extinction has been attributed to a variety of factors, including war with Homo sapiens, social demographics, climatic change and just plain chance. The connection between the disappearance of the Neanderthals, and the arrival of anatomically modern Homo sapiens in Europe at the start of the Neanderthal extinction, has also received considerable attention. However, because there is little to no evidence of violence or direct rivalry between these two human kinds, some anthropologists think it is just a coincidence. These twist of fate, anthropologists go on to claim that modern Homo sapiens and Neanderthal brains and behavior were exact replicas of one another. Indeed, 
there are many anthropologists who believe that Neanderthal extinction was caused solely by resource competition rather than a violent conflict. Some claim that Homo sapiens were able to exploit more resources from the same habitats because of slight, but significant, cognitive changes between these two human cousins. Were Neanderthals responsible for their own extinction? Did the primitive behavior of Neanderthals eventually lead to their own extinction when modern humans started populating the environment to which they were extremely well adapted? Could the demise of the Neanderthals have been accelerated by a Neanderthal desire for Neanderthal meat? To investigate the causes of the demise of the Neanderthals, Spanish anthropologists conducted a virtual experiment. They included cannibalism, to reduce competition and obtain additional resources, the size of the group, the location of the group with a defined home range, and the likelihood that a group will split in two in their experimental model, fission. Their computer model produced provocative results. From the perspective of game theory, cannibalism seems to be the best method for obtaining resources. Endocannibalism and exocannibalism are the two types of cannibalism that need to be distinguished in this situation. A group eating its own members is known as endocannibalism. When a group is starving, this sort of cannibalism may be used to ensure the survival of the effective, for example working and reproducing members of the group by eating the very young or very elderly members. Following the passing of a group member, endocannibalism may also be practiced for ritualistic or symbolic purposes. Be aware that while it might be considered murder in the former situation, respect for the deceased may be implied in the later. In contrast, exocannibalism entails consuming members of other groups. Exocannibalism may be used to reduce competition for a group's resources, such as food and shelter, to scare off rival groups, or for nutritional or symbolic purposes. When resources were abundant, neither endo nor exocannibalism would be necessary for survival. Cannibalism, however, would have been a desirable feature in environments where food was few and all conditions were challenging, such in extremely cold weather. Under the latter circumstances, Groups that supported exocannibalism might be able to acquire more resources, avoid going extinct, and lessen competition from other groups. They included a new kind of human, which is non cannibalistic anatomically modern humans who first arrived in Europe some 40,000 years ago, in their final virtual model. The exocannibalistic group had vanished at the end of the simulation. They came to the conclusion from their simulation that the cannibalizing societies were not found in resource rich regions and either resided in desert or remote locations. It's interesting to notice that this precisely fits the circumstances leading to the demise of the Neanderthals. In their scenario, although some individuals may profit, the species as a whole does not, making cannibalism a very detrimental feature. It's also important to remember that their model presupposes that Neanderthals exclusively engaged in exocannibalism, against other Neanderthal groups, which is what evidence suggests. Anthropologists examined 99 Neanderthal skeletons found in a cave in Belgium, that was dated to between 45,000 and 40,000 years ago. They found blatant proof of cannibalism in their analysis, as well as the usage of Neanderthal bones to sharpen defleshing tools. On about one-third of the bones, there were obvious signs of cuts, and there were also percussion markings, notches and pits. These remains were not only cannibalized but they were also discovered with numerous other species, primarily reindeer and horses. There were also a lot of massive animal bones that had undergone the same processing as the Neanderthal bones. Reviewing six additional Neanderthal cannibalistic incidents, from 120,000 to 39,000 years ago, reveals that all of them involved Neanderthals who had previously committed Neanderthal cannibalism. The riddle is further complicated by the fact that animal bones were abundantly present and processed in several of the aforementioned situations. To obtain the nutrient-rich marrow, lengthier bones were sliced in comparable ways on both Neanderthal skeletons and those of animals. If there were so many creatures around, why would Neanderthals consume other Neanderthals? There is proof that Neanderthals occasionally consumed vegetables and other non-meat meals, indicating that they did not limit themselves to only meat resources. Some Neanderthals may have started using cannibalism as a prime tactic for securing resources, and minimizing competition some 120,000 years ago. 
In certain Neanderthal societies, however, it may have started an almost 80,000-year history of gustatory cannibalism, that is, some Neanderthals merely delighted in the flavor of Neanderthal meat. Additionally, it seems improbable that each Neanderthal tribe separately adopted the custom over an 80,000-year period. Rather, it was more likely a Neanderthal tradition that was handed down down the generations. Then why did they do this? One hypothesis is that Neanderthals' olfactory bulbs were smaller than those of modern Homo sapiens, which may have affected their capacity to distinguish between various odors, notably that of burning human flesh, which firefighters universally agree smells awful and exceedingly foul. The disappearance of our closest living relatives will forever be a mystery, but it also raises a number of other questions, including whether or not brain differences matter, the significance of scent in human evolution, and whether or not Homo sapiens will eventually be supplanted. The La Chapel Auxiliary Saint skeleton shows evidence that Neanderthals led stressful lives with high risk of injury, and that they experienced considerable bodily degeneration from daily activities. Such evidence includes the loss of most of the cheek teeth and associated degeneration of the jaw joint, inflammation of the ear canals, indicating a possible loss of hearing, serious osteoarthritis of one shoulder, massive osteoarthritic degeneration of the neck vertebrae, a damaged hip joint, and a healed rib fracture. Though this individual died in his 30s, he survived for years with these degenerative conditions and injuries. The skeleton therefore demonstrates not only that Neanderthals had the physical strength partly to compensate for limitations in their technology, but also that they had a social network that enabled long-term survival of injured and infirm members of the group. The skeleton also provided the first evidence of mortuary ritual among the Neanderthals, as the body was intentionally buried in a pit in the middle of the small cave. However, when it came to relationships, Neanderthals liked to keep it in the family, but were Neanderthals doomed by their inbreeding? In one case, a Neanderthal woman had parents who were half-siblings, double first cousins, or an uncle-niece couple. Scientists keep prying into the sex lives of Neanderthals. In the past decade, they've revealed that Neanderthals got busy with both Homo sapiens and Denisovans, another lineage of now extinct humans. But there's more. Mounting evidence suggests Neanderthals also had a habit of inbreeding, or conceiving with close relatives. Several studies have now reported this based on genetic patterns and bone abnormalities thought to result from intrafamily flings. First, let's review the facts behind these claims of consanguinity, or mating between relatives. Then let's consider the consequences. How did inbreeding impact Neanderthal health and survival? If inbreeding took down royal dynasties, it may have taken a toll on Neanderthals. The first strong case of Neanderthal inbreeding came when scientists published a genome extracted from a toe bone found in the Altai, mountains of Siberia. Alive roughly 120,000 years ago, this Neanderthal woman had closely related parents, such as half-siblings, double first cousins, an uncle-niece couple or some other combination with equal relatedness. For instance, they could have had the same mother, but different fathers, the half-sibling scenario, or shared both sets of grandparents, the double first cousins case. Even if the Altai individual descended from a long line of inbreeds, that's just one Siberian population, living over 4,000 miles from what is considered to be the Neanderthal heartland in Europe. The fact that the Altai population mated with kin doesn't mean that behavior was typical for the species. So what about European Neanderthals? Several lines of evidence suggest inbreeding among Neanderthals from El Cidron, Spain. At this site, over 2,500 bone fragments have been recovered constituting at least 13 individuals of both sexes and various ages. Archaeologists investigating El Cidron believe the skeletons represent a close-knit Neanderthal group, that died together around 50,000 years ago, these Neanderthals also show signs of cannibalism, but that's besides the point. In the El Cidron remains, congenital features included cleft or asymmetric vertebrae, a misshapen kneecap and a baby tooth retained into adulthood. The identified conditions are rare in living humans, between 3.8 to 0.00004%, and may be harmless, but they do occur more frequently in cases of inbreeding. In other words, these skeletal features suggest the parents were kin, 